question. Um, I work in Earth Lab as a postdoc, uh, and my research looks at our research team. Um, and I'm look at, looking at mining socially generated data, so primarily social media data um, and incident management data. And we're looking at using that as a social sensor to integrate with study of Earth systems and hazards. Um, and so I also, I did my doctorate here at CU as part of Project EPIC. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my research today for that. Um, so my research is in a field called crisis informatics. Um, and it's a relatively new research field. And it looks at how social media and information and communication technologies are changing the way that people communicate and share information in disaster and crisis events. So my research looks specifically at how um, the use of social media in emergency management. So how emergency responders are learning to innovate with these new technologies as part of their disaster communications. Um, and so it's been really quick. It's been easy for members of the public to adopt social media as part of their communications. But it's been a lot more challenging for so before I talk about that a little bit, I want to give you a feel for, for what things looked like pre-social media. So in the old days before social media, um, emergency response organizations really controlled the message around what was happening in a disaster. And they did that primarily through three main channels. So they would twice a day typically hold a press release um, where they would meet and share the latest update. Um, and within communities, they often hold public meetings. They still do that. But another main way of connecting with people impacted by disaster is a public meeting. And something they call working a trap line, which is setting up spots in the surrounding community where they can post updated disaster information. Um, and one thing that has made it really difficult for emergency response organizations to adopt social media is that Emergency response organizations follow something called a strict formal command and control structure. So any information that they release has to go through formal approval with the incident commander. So the person at the top has to okay every single communication, which as you know in disaster, things happen quickly and information breaks almost instantaneously on social media. So um, social media has created whole new sources of information. Um, and there's a lot of attention, especially initially, to this idea of citizen journalism. So people on scene capturing footage and sharing it on their social media channels. Um, but I think, so and I also wanted to say, this is really informal. So if you have questions as I go, to ask. Um, so but I'd like to point out from my research what I've noticed. It's, it goes beyond just people being able to share personal information in disaster. Um, social media has made it possible for all different sources of information and, and uh, contributors to communicate with one another. So this is a sample tweet from the 2014 Carlton Complex wildfire. Um, and I like this example because it shows how things are interconnected. Um, so this. Fire. So this tweet was on July 18th in the afternoon. Um, the fire was only about 49,000 acres at that point. And overnight, it's very similar to the wine country fires. Overnight, it grew by over 100,000 acres. And um, this is when it was starting to heat up. And this was by a local resident who was pulling her boat off the water. And she tweeted this photo as they were doing it. And you can see, if you look through the comment streams, people start contacting her for more information, specifically the media. So we were able to trace through and find the actual media interview and her whole description of what happened to her. And then as I followed her tweets during the incident, we could see her evacuation. We could see as she was returning to back to her home after the evacuation orders were lifted. And this is will start contacting her. So there's not the same formal constraint for citizens to tweet out information. And as she was going back in, 
people communicated with her on Twitter asking for more information. And this is an example of a reply to someone where she says somebody was looking for information for a specific area. And she said, I don't know. These are from the lower part of Indian Dan. OK, the orchards are OK, but most other areas burn. So this is a good example of how. So she's communicating with the media, and she's also communicating with locals. Um, and then another example that I would have put in here, but um, social media, it's not just media and individuals. Emergency responders have been able to use social media to improvise as well. So we did a study during Hurricane Sandy where um, when other channels fail, so in the, in the most heavily impacted area of New York City, there were a lot of people who chose not to evacuate um, and they were trapped. And there was also a fire that caused massive destruction. And so the 911 system became overloaded. And luckily, there was the woman who manned the Twitter account at, at um, Fire Department of New York. People started improvising and tweeting 911 requests over Twitter. And so when it happened, she immediately pushed back and said, call 911. But when they started to get the feel for the gravity of the situation, they started improvising with Twitter, essentially as a 911 operator. So Emily Rahimi from FDNY um, started improvising and gathering information and updating on Twitter. And then you would think that might be a one-of-a-kind incident, but it happened again in Hurricane Harvey. So I just wanted to highlight how there's flow across all these different sources in a disaster. So moving to something that I think is really significant in um, disaster is that social media has also offered ways for communities to organize in response around an event. I'd like to highlight a couple different um, examples from my own research. So emergency response organizations are starting to set up pages around the information pages on Facebook around an incident. And this gives them the ability to start communicating directly with the public in a disaster. Um, and when this, so this is from the Wolverine fire. And when I remember when I was working with one of the teams that put up one first Facebook pages, there was all this concern that they would get trolled and that they were vulnerable. And it was interesting. So during, I think it was Berry Point Fire, we did get a troll, somebody who was really, a member of the public who was really angry and just going off on the Facebook page. But what we found is that the crowd controlled it. So other members of the community kept them in check and responded. So the incident management team thought, do we need to jump in here and deal with this? And they stood back for a little bit, and the public self-corrected, which I thought was really interesting. Um, communities themselves often set up pages. Uh, when I was working on the Wenatchee complex, there was this local pub that became the gathering place for the community. So people who were evacuated gathered there for meals and to organize and help one another. And the owner of the pub set up interesting posts on her Facebook page so that one was of a home, so people who, who either needed a home or had space to offer could, could coordinate that on that post. They had um, a picture of a truck that people could help each other evacuate. So I thought that was really interesting how on the ground and online overlapped. Um, and then another incident that I worked that I thought was really interesting is I work with one of the federal teams, National Incident Management teams, Portland Nemo. And the lead PIO for that has decided that she doesn't want to be the official communicator anymore. So she works hard to put the information directly in community pages. And one of the first attempts was Funny River Fire in Alaska, where they set up this communication channel between the local emergency response, um, the national team, and the community. And it was pretty interesting. So this just gives you a feel for what's possible um, on community sites. Uh, this is an example from the Jefferson Car County Sheriff's Department page during the floods. So something to think about is not only were the work resident sheltering place, but the emergency response organization was sheltering in place as well. So um, Coal Creek Canyon had where this, uh, they had the, the most heavily damaged area. 
Um, residents were using the Jeffco Sheriff's page to communicate with one another. And this is an example that the Sheriff's Office posted of a mailbox in the middle of the floodwaters. And you could see the owner of the mailbox saying, hey, are you still up there? Could you get my mail for me? And it was kind of, I thought that was kind of funny. So the other really significant change is that social media has um, led to this phenomenon of digital volunteerism. So you're no longer restricted by geography. You don't have to be local to volunteer and help out. And so I'd like to highlight some of the um, examples that I think are the most significant. This isn't the area of my research, but I actually know a lot about these examples if you have any questions. So one of the big examples is um, following the earthquake in Haiti. Um, Patrick Meyer from a, um, developed an open source application called Ushahidi, which is a crisis mapping tool. And um, after the earthquake hit in Haiti, he was sitting in his living room with some of his um, crisis mapping friends, and they thought, well, we want to do something. So they propped up a crisis map, and over a relatively short period of time, they ended up having this massive globally dis distributed response where they had translators who were taking information in Haitian Creole, translating it to other people who would figure out where it was positioned on the map so that emergency response teams could start to see what was happening where. Another innovation came from with a couple people with a project, Epic. It's this idea of um, formalizing your tweet content, so using a, a syntax to your tweet so that it could be machine decipherable and put on a map. So these are an example of um, the format that you'd use. You would use hashtag labels so that they could parse out specific pieces of information, such as location, the address, um, what's needed. Um, you get a feel for it. But what they weren't, they were expecting that people who were impacted would adopt this syntax, but that's not actually what happened in Haiti there ended up being this distributed group of volunteers who were picking up and retranslating content into this format. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to point out is... Oh, okay. <laughs> Was that... Okay. Um, so... Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, how many of you are familiar with OpenStreetMap? So there's a humanitarian group within OpenStreetMap that are focused on crisis mapping. Um, and so after the earthquake in Haiti, a bunch of volunteers came in and used various sources of information, like satellite data, to start filling in the blanks. There was very little information about the road network and damages on the ground. And so they organized quickly and built up a map in real time to help those on the ground. Um, and then the next thing they've done is identify high risk areas to actively go in and, build, and create the infrastructure. So for, for instance, in Nepal, before the earthquake hit in Nepal, they were actively mapping that area so that there would be more information in the event of an earthquake. Um, So then, now I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to talk more about what's been in emergency. Um, so as I mentioned, so when I first started my research, there were many, um, so social media in general within emergency response was seen as risky um, and a source of misinformation and rumor, so not a valuable channel of communication. But within the emergency response community, there was this growing group of emergency responders interested in exploring new ways to integrate social media. Um, and one of them was an emergency manager in New Mexico named Jeff Phillips. And he came up with this idea that emergency responders could implement a different form of um, digital volunteerism. So rather than taking spontaneous volunteers, they would organize within themselves and use technology to set up virtual teams. So, um, for instance, Jeff has a, a team of eight 
emergency responders across the country, and if any of them had a disaster, they would come to each other's aid. So to get this idea out, he um, set up a proof of concept at, an, at a national emergency management conference. And one of the people at that conference was a public information officer for Portland Nemo, who I work with quite a bit, named Chris Erickson. And she, as a federal, as a member of the USDA, they had a strict mandate against the use of social media. She could not physically touch any form of social media, or she risked being fired. And she saw Jeff's idea as a way to bend the rules. So she knew when she did this, she risked losing her job. But she, so she was responsible for implementing the first emergency, um, virtual emergency support team, or virtual operational support team, or VOST, during the Shadow Lake fire in fall of 2011. Um, and that was successful, and it got the idea out there, and then emergency response teams put herself out there. And the idea of, of a VOST has grown, and it's now, I forget, I think there's roughly 75 teams worldwide. Um, and then um, the interesting thing is that it's grown beyond this idea of a knit group, this global community teams. And they have these open, continuous channels of communication. So if something happens anywhere in the world, members of this community jump on and start doing monitoring and, and are readying themselves for support. So it's this 24-7 expandable network, just to give you a feel for that. Um, and then I wanted to talk about a little bit about um, how we all know about um, citizen journalism, but I think that social media has created this new opportunity for emergency response organizations to become essentially responder journalists. So generating the, the content that their communities need most in the format that makes it easy for them to get at. And one of the most advanced teams that I know of worldwide is right here in Colorado. It's the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. Um, and they've developed what they call their integrated social media plan, which they've, it evolved over a series of fires and it's, they've done a lot of work to figure out how to leverage each of the options they have open to them in um, the best possible way. Um, and then in 2013, how many of you guys were here for the floods? Um, and so you know that most of the media attention was in Boulder County and to the north. But Jefferson County had really serious damage, but they weren't getting any media coverage or attention. Um, and so this was when their social media strategy got put to the test. Um, and I like this quote from um, Mark Techmeyer from Jeffco. He said, when information is so readily available in the rest of their lives and they have a catastrophic event, it, it better be even more readily available. And so that's their philosophy. And so they, they've set themselves up in a way that they can generate their own localized content. So I'm gonna give you a little feel for that. So this is a map of the damage. So you can see how many counties were, um, had disaster declarations in them. Okay, so that's just a view of, overview of the flood. So one of the things that they see is they use a blog as they call it their information backbone. And that's sort of their ongoing live um, press release. So instead of having, okay, they use a blog as an ongoing press release for anybody who's interested, specifically the residents in their county. And they put, the other thing is that they link to all their other channels of communication. So this is an example. So the, something that I think they do that I believe we'll start to see more of is they, they embed public information, members of the public information team and a cameraman in their emergency response efforts. So they're on the front line gathering footage. Um, and during the floods, it was that footage that was getting aired on the evening news. So this is an example of an embedded PIO response. Oops, I'm going, sorry, hit the wrong button. Um, so they use Twitter 
and the press, the media knows this, local media knows this, they use that as both their notice to the public and they send content to the media through Twitter. So this is an example of video footage that they captured that then ran, they watched it 10 minutes later run on the evening news. Um, their tweets, they've watched, they know how to craft a tweet so that it's picked up and run across the news ticker at the bottom of the screen. Um, so here's an example of a couple tweets that are news ticker worthy. And so they also use Facebook in a way that's really interesting. So they use that. So, um, and they see this as really critical because it's a place where, where um, their consi constituents can ask questions and communicate with them directly. And they feel like they can keep tabs on the people that they support best. Um, and now I'm going to shift gears and talk about Twitter in general. So why is Twitter? Twitter is the place that people often go to for breaking information and disaster. And so there's a few reasons why that's the case. First of all, it's an open network. You don't, it's not based on reciprocal relationships. I don't, ha I don't have to have somebody follow me back to look at what they're posting on Twitter. So it's open. So you can look across all sorts of sources of information, media, individual, official, all in one stream, which makes it really convenient. Um, the other thing is that Twitter allows you to embed content either directly or through a hyperlink. So if you think about it, a tweet now becomes a survey of, of information related across the inter internet. So it could be Instagram, it could be YouTube, it could be a website, you can put any, you can link to any source of information. The other thing is that the process of retweeting constantly pushes the most relevant information directly into the stream. So that means that what you're seeing is typically the most timely. And so people keep pushing that back into the stream until it ages off and then it'll just disappear. Um, but the problem with Twitter is it's incredibly noisy. So just an overview of a tweet. Um, so this is my favorite tweet from The Onion, disaster-related tweet. Um, so a tweet itself is of information. So the username is what you call yourself. So on Twitter, I'm Lee St. Dennis. And then the handle is your at ID. So at the onion is the onions. Um, and then there's a timestamp, so telling you when this was tweeted, so you can gauge the relevancy of it if you're searching. And then the text, so I think it's 140 characters, but now they've expanded it to 280. Um, and then hashtag, do you guys know the history of a hashtag, why that came about? Anybody? No, it was actually Chris Messina, and it came from the 2000 California. And he saw the hashtag as a way to organize groups around, um, organize groups of people and around events. Um, and it was adopted and became the convention almost immediately. Um, I talked about links and embedded media. Um, emergency response organizations have found that if they want their tweet to be read, they have to embed some sort of content, otherwise it'll be ignored. Um, Twitter also allows you to reply to people. So if you see something, somebody tweets something and you want to contact them directly, you can reply to it. Um, you can retweet it, so you can push it to your followers and back into the stream of people looking at information around that event. Um, you can also favorite something. Um, and then if you turn on geolocation on your phone, that tweet will contain your latitude and longitude. Um, but we found that only roughly about 1% of tweets are geolocated, which I think surprises a lot of people. Um, I think that it gets turned off a lot because it's, it sucks your battery life. Um, but there are certain, so we've done analysis to figure out whether people consciously turn their geolocation on. 
It often gets turned on by default with Instagram. I think there are a couple key applications that turn it on. And so it may or may not be relevant. It's typically not a conscious decision. Um, so looking at something I work with is um, looking at who's tweeting. So, and this is useful for network analysis, if any of you guys are gonna do any sort of network analysis with Twitter. So in your, in your user profile, you have a username, and it, the, your user ID is the Twitter ID given to you, um, and as I mentioned, your handle. And you can put a description of who you are, which can be helpful for my research. You can also link to your own website in Twitter. So if you're a member of the media, you can link to the media website, for instance, or your personal blog. Um, and then location, so given that only 1% of tweets are geolocated, location can be useful, although it's often very vague. So people put United States or Washington or um, I've ended up in Urban Dictionary a few times. <laughs> so it's free form. Um, down to specific, people can put their exact latitude and longitude in there as well. So it's highly variable. Um, the user profile will also tell you how many tweets someone has, how many followers they have, and how, and how many people they're following, um, which can be really useful um, gauge. Is this a bot or is, you know, you can start to, to detect credibility of somebody um, and when they were created. Um, and if somebody's a brand new account, by default, you get this egg picture. So you know often it's a new account if you see the egg. Um, and then just to give you an example, in Earth Lab, uh, we used, so one of the researchers was looking at flood data, and it's difficult to come by flood data. It often takes years, and it's in these vague polygons. So we used an ongoing flood collection from Project Epic, and we took all of the 2012 um, flood-related tweets, and we did some cleaning, and it turned out it was actually not as difficult as you might think to, to pull out the noise. Um, and so we got it to about 85% on topic. And this, we mapped the flood damage in 2012. And you can see we are able to create much more precise polygon or much more pr precise boundaries around the damage in Hurricane Sandy. So that's an example. Um, the other thing that I'm working on that I wanted to tell you a little more about is so I'm using Twitter, as you can see, my background has been working with emergency response teams, but I'm looking at using Twitter in two ways. So I use it as an earth data scientist to look at social disruption. Um, and so we're looking at key attributes within Twitter. So we have a collection, um, I'm working with a researcher looking at megafires. So I have Twitter collections across over 50 megafires. Um, and we're looking at volume of tweets and patterns of retweeting. So this is another, this is the, the daily profile from the Carlton Complex. Um, and orange are retweets and the blue are original tweets. And you can see that when the, when the fire was most disruptive, there's a high volume of retweets relative to new content. And then as the, as the disruption tapers off, it's much more original content and the retweeting is diminished. Um, yeah, we did have, so this, so this peak here, so this was the, um, when it grew by over 100,000 acres overnight. This peak here is when it was declared the largest fire in Wa Washington state history. So you can, you, can, you can correlate it with events pretty easily. And see tweet. Right. It's like a monumental tweet. And that's something I'm, part of my research right now is looking at, um, I'm using Twitter from an earth science perspective to figure out where along a spectrum of social disruption something sits. So is it, a, an ex, is it at the extreme or somewhere in between? <coughs> and one of the things, like this peak illustrates how something becomes a globally visible event so worldwide media picks it up and people worldwide are talking about it. Um, and so I'm looking at building a classifier that will help me detect these key shifts when it moves from 
along the spectrum of local to global, if that makes sense. Um, this is a profile of a typical day. So you often see a spike first thing in the morning when the morning updates go out. Um, and then it remains fairly high, and then in the evening it drops down and tapers off again. Um, and then the other thing that, the other key piece of my research is I'm working with Amazon Web Services, the disaster response team. So we're looking at, I have a strategy for identifying information coming from individual and local sources. So like that tweet that you saw earlier from um, the person pulling their boat off the water. So being able to filter out and get down to that information for the communities and for the emergency response teams, that's the focus of one of my current projects. And this was a test of that filtering logic. So you can see this is the worst day of the fire. And I was part of a very small response team doing monitoring. And we were not able to keep up with it. But here's the, after we developed the filtering algorithm, um, during the peak, there were only 56 or 54 tweets in one hour that were, were um, likely individual and local. And that became a one-person job. And so the following summer, we tried it out on a series of fires where I simulated real time. And we were able to really efficiently use the resources on the emergency response team. So this is a look at um, the, cat the classification I've done to identify. So within that filtered data set, how highly localized it is, the content that we're trying to get at. Um, and that's it. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Miami, Houston. Are those places that did see floods, or were those people who live in a place who know people who live in places that have floods? Was there some amount of noise? That, like, if you look at the, at the flood, Colorado floods tweets, if you look at the geolocated tweets, you get some in Africa, which are obviously not related to the Colorado floods. So there is a certain amount of noise in there. Um, but, when, but if you see, so we filtered out, you had to have a certain number for it to show up on the map. So um, these are where we saw a concentration of tweets. And the researcher who was looking at the data went through and these correlate with different flood events. So the ones that are showing up here do actually correlate with a flood event. Which may be in those locations or? With a flood, flood event in those locations, yeah. We went through and looked at that. Yeah. So maybe this isn't the most elegant way of uh, phrasing this, but people have the ability to <clears throat> neither delete tweets or their accounts in general. So do you have to work with like an archive or a snapshot of Twitter, especially like, when you're doing reanalysis or stuff like that? Yeah, we have to be really careful. I have to be careful in my research that if I publish something that that tweet has not been deleted. Right. Um, so how do you work, how do you manage the data in that way? Um, if I'm publishing, so if we have it, we still use it as part of our analysis. But if we go to publish an example, so for the tweets that were part of Hurricane Sandy, they're part of the, they were part of the, the ones we published were part of the public record. We anonymized them, so we made up new account names. But we were very careful not to publish anything that wasn't still publicly available at that point in time. Okay. But yeah, that's, that's an important consideration. And now you can mark your account private, so we can't use anything for somebody who's marked their account private. Not even as uh, analysis? I use it in the analysis. Okay. The analysis part. Not as something I publish as a conference paper or research paper. What percentage of people do you think use Twitter? It's an interesting question. I don't know. I'd be interested in knowing. I would say it's fading in popularity to some extent. Um, 
I also, I have collections from 2010 to present, and one of the things I want to look at is the shift in bot traffic. Where are bots hard to tell? They, so they're they better at writing bot scripts or? Um, I'm looking at using a bot detector from University of Indiana um, that gives you a probability that an account is a bot. There's like a Turing test on it, I guess. Yeah. It looks, so I think based on my own experience classifying data, you, you look at information from their user profile and then their tweet history to figure that out. And who and the following follower relationships. Yeah. So the Jefferson County integrated social media plan. Is Jefferson County able to implement that because they're small enough that they can work with the command and control? So so you know what's really interesting, interesting is they they got a lot, lot of attention, attention during the Jefferson County floods. And part of why they're so successful is that they have a tight knit relationship with their community. But that idea was then adopted by our state um, Office of Emergency Management. And so now the Jefferson County team doesn't exist in the same form. So they're part of the Department of Homeland Security Emergency Management. And so any county in Colorado can request a VOS team. And they, ha they use those same techniques. We just haven't, since that happened, we really haven't had any significant fires or disaster events. But it, it now exists at the state level. Um, and it's um, mostly we've done sporting events or big events where they want just help monitoring for um, community issues. Yeah. So if the, the Twitter uses, you know, drops slowly or I don't know, what is it replaced by as far as text-based media that could be used for this type of work? So I still think people turn to Twitter in disaster, but I think that personal use of Twitter is dropping off. So um, although I still, I'm often amazed by people who tweet everything from their day. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's no good replacement yet. I've seen a couple, um, I've seen a couple interesting ideas, haven't really taken off yet. Um, one that built a Twitter-like microblogging tool um, in the Midwest, where they there was this approval process to be part of the network, and it worked like Twitter. But there is no true replacement yet. I think it, it holds kind of a unique space. I think too, there's like a lot of there's certain facets of the data science community. So like, if you're an R user, Twitter is an awesome place to be because like. Some of the key like players in developing our packages and our tools are on Twitter and will actually respond like to you. Like, oh, I've, wow. I've taught like Hadley Wickham, like I've actually interacted with him directly. And he, I'm nobody, right? Like he doesn't know me personally, but he he's responded to me. And so I mean, I mean, like I'm nobody, but like I'm not a known person. And so um, if you're into R, there's a strong community. There's a pretty good Python community in the data training like workshops, uh, software and data carpentry, that community. So there's certain tech-focused communities that are really strong on, t on Twitter. And I don't know, they have listservs and stuff, but they're not nearly as, as powerful as Twitter. That's, that's, that's a really good point. point. So the community that I work with organize around the SMEM hashtag. So it's hashtag SMEM, which stands for Social Media and Emergency yeah. Management. And it's that same way. They informally tweet on Fridays at 10 a.m. And somebody will table a topic on Twitter. And it's a way that people who don't necessarily know each other, and it's really open and um, friendly. So somebody from completely, somebody who's completely a stranger to the community can jump in. Like you can post something and somebody will respond to you. Yeah, I'll even post things like, um, I want to create an animated map in R, and like I Google and don't get any good responses, and I'll, like someone will send me their code. Like I, I, I'm pretty active on Twitter, so probably my tweets get seen a little bit more because of that. But I've literally had like people help me with stuff on Twitter. I, I try to help them. There's, there's in certain, there's certain communities that are pretty awesome and powerful on Twitter. That might change, but right now they're still, they're still going strong.
And there's a whole, I didn't mention this in my talk, but there's a whole volunteer community that met on Twitter and organized and became something called, a nonprofit called Humanity Road. So it's a way for people to connect. And our ladies. Are they? Are they? It's a women <laughs> R coder group, and they're popping up all over the world. And they all have Twitter accounts. It's like, it's crazy. So. Yeah. How sensitive do, you, do your analysis have to be to like misspellings and hashtags? Do you have to come so that? sometimes it's a huge, so there's a couple issues that come up. One is that there's, I forget that there was an, Indian name of a fire, and so we had to do a gazillion combinations. I'm exaggerating, obviously, but we had to come up with all the potential misspellings and do a collection on those. Um, the um, tsunami in the Philippines. Do you know how many misspell how many possible spellings of Philippines there are? So we had to think. We had to anticipate all of that. And the other side of the coin is that. Um, you can capture a lot of noise, not because of misspellings, but because of the genericness of, say, an incident name, or that it overlaps. Like the Wolverine fire um, overlaps with the Wolverine character from, forget what that. X-Men. X-Men, yeah. Thank you. Obviously awesome. not in the know, but that became the mascot of the fire because we got, we kept, we inadvertently captured so much communication around a movie that was coming out at the time, so. How do you separate that out? So, that's part of my research and the filtering to figure out, what I'm, what I'm working on now is building out the base filtering algorithm. The other thing that's super noisy, it serves an important social purpose, but in really tragic events, people use Twitter to offer condolences and emotional support. So for instance, um, I worked the, um, the memorial for the Granite Mountain Hotshots for the Yarnell Hill fire. And so I think that that Twitter collection is roughly 12 million tweets in that bounded time. Um, and a very large portion of that were emotional support tweets. And so Finding ways to, even though it serves an important social purpose, figuring out ways to filter that out is another piece of my research so that emergency responders can get at what's coming from the local community.